Here, in the chapel of Tobol's house, during the dark days of the Great War, thousands of soldiers received often their first, but also their last Holy Communion. Here they prayed and tried to find the courage to face it all again. Now you too can join us live on Facebook Sunday morning 9th of May from a mystery location as we bring home a Talbot House artifact lost for over 50 years back to its rightful place in the Talbot House Chapel. Join us! Curious yet? Watch the video! After four long years of occupation and several months of anticipation following the Normandy landings, the people are eagerly looking forward to celebrating liberation. From the end of August onwards, more and more German troops coming from France were hurriedly passing through the town. The occupants of Talbot's house also decided to take off. Before they did, they started the bonfire of their files and documents on the ground floor. No sooner had they disappeared, then the next door neighbor, Marcel de Rink, and another jarring local, Charles Dupont, both of whom had also helped with the evacuation of the souvenirs, ran to the house, carefully looking out for booby traps or demolition charges. Luckily, they arrived before the bonfire had got good hold and they were able to put it out. Finally, the big moment had arrived. On Wednesday 6 September, shortly before 1 p.m., a distant roar could be heard, coming closer and closer. The news spread quickly that the liberators were approaching. People started hanging out Belgian flags from their windows and gathered in their doorways. In front of Talbot's house, a huge Union Jack was unfolded in the middle of the street. Moment before, the first Polish tank from the armored division rolled past, followed by a second one 50 yards behind. As the tanks came in at one end of the market square, a couple of German vehicles with guns pulled out at the other end heading towards Ypres. Before long, a large crowd of townspeople flocked around the Liberators, waving small Belgian and Union Jack flags and giving them flowers, warm handshakes and embraces. Here you can see several photographs taken just outside Talbot's house with some of the Talbot Housians, the Batu family, and on the market square as well. On the right hand side you can see Jean Batu, for instance. Apparently the first Brit to re-enter Pop was Frank Gillard of the BBC, who had done several stints of wardening at Talbot House before the war. Listeners to the Midnight News on 7th of September heard the following announcement. Hello BBC, this is Frank Gillard in Northern Belgium. The Polish Armoured Division pushing on rapidly from saint omer yesterday. We came to Popperinge, a name that will bring back memories to hundreds of thousands of the fighting men of those days. I'm glad to bring the news that Talbot's house in Popperinge, which was a home from home to our troops in the last war, and which was the birthplace of Tok Age, Talbot's house stands intact, with scarcely a pane of glass broken. A great Union Jack was hanging from the upper windows. The big front door swung open, and there, in the entrance hall, stood the reception committee, armed members of the Belgian resistance movement, who were standing guard over this precious piece of British property. The Germans living there had made themselves really comfortable. The remains of their last meal lay on the table in Tubby's room, overlooking the gardens on the first floor, which had been their mess. Several of the plates are still in the Talbot House collection and are now on display in our new exhibition. But what of Rini and Alida? I forced my way through the crowds on the square, past the lines of collaborators still being marched into the Hotel de Ville by the Patriots and walked right into the front door of the old folks building. A sister led me to the door of Olida's room. She was sitting all alone in a high chair at a little table by the window. My hasty entry was a great shock to her. I should have been announced. For a moment she was speechless. Then she was weeping on my shoulder. Her first words were, René, he is dead. Five minutes later she had completely recovered herself and was her own lively self again, telling how she had protected Talbot House against the Germans. 
She and René had longed for our return. It became an obsession with René. Will they never come? All the more precious belongings of the house, she told me, were in safekeeping. She asked eagerly after all their old friends. She had been hearing regularly from Rex, and in quite a different way from me. For tucked away in a dark corner of her little room, she had a radio set to which she was listening daily to the BBC, despite the Nazi ban. Only down lives for the day when Tok H men and women will return to Talbot House. She begs me to urge Paul to come with all speed. When I left her, the rain had ceased, and she was putting on her clothes, getting ready to pay her first post-liberation visit to the old house. With all her widowhood and her 70 years, her loyalty to the family remains as ever. The first unit to take charge of Talbot's house were 2757 Squadron RAF. Together with a local group of girls, the bridge builders, they organized catering for the soldiers. The Belgian members of the Talbot House Association decided they would wait for their president, Major Slesser, to come over before returning all of the precious artifacts. In December, President Paul Slesser and Barclay Baron from Tokage arrived on site along with Warden Charles Young and Padre Sean Heron. Barclay's recounts, sitting at a tea table of a member of the White Brigade, I watched him bring out of his cupboard First, all our old albums of photographs, so familiar to the Tok Age pilgrims. Then the communicants roll, Padre's logs, books, and the communion plate, carefully wrapped in leather. After two days of hard work, the upper room stood completely in every detail. Eventually, on Friday 8 December, the big door swung open at 10 a.m. As Barkis recorded, the troops streamed in for tea and biscuits on the ground floor, as in 1915. The piano awoke to constant music. Upstairs, in no less than five rooms, men sat all day long writing letters home, reading or chatting by the stove. One fact that has struck us all at first was the immense interest which these men, who had fought across the African desert and lately came out of the watery hell of Holland, displayed in the story of the old house and every relic by the old-fashioned war in which their fathers fought. Many officers, from the brigadier downwards, and men of all ranks and services, climbed to the upper room. The old house had come alive again, and in the faith of friendship and its familiar rooms, the armies of the past and present had joined hands. As soon as Talbot House was reopened, the troops were served in the canteen by a team of popperinger women, Madame Arlette Duclos recounted her experiences as follows. All ladies that wanted to help were divided into groups. From 8 or 9 a.m. until midnight, we handed out cups of tea. We had big tea urns. There was also a small shop selling chocolate, cigarettes, etc. There was always seemingly an endless row of soldiers queuing up from outside. Yvonne Batu added the following anecdote. Sometimes he worked till 4 a.m., Although we didn't have permission, one night a soldier peeped through the door. It was pouring with rain and he was absolutely soaked. I invited him in, but he told me he and his battalion were expecting orders to move out at any minute. I told him to go and get all of his friends for a cup of tea. In five minutes time, the house was overflowing. They were sitting everywhere, on the staircases leading up to the upper floors, even in the chapel. Suddenly, a general entered. He said... What's happening here? I replied, Well, nothing, sir. It's raining so badly. Why should these boys be standing in the rain? Come in and have a cup of yourself. He was sitting on a chair in the kitchen and said, I have never seen such a thing in my life. I responded, There's always a first time, sir. We have lived with the Jerrys, you understand. And you are our friends. We love you. You should have seen him. He was more than happy. And so were his men. The women called themselves the bridge builders and also started meeting regularly in the old house. Jean Mathieu recounts, We brought old clothes and made doll clothes out of them for the orphan children. Sometimes we were assisted by an English soldier, Murphy, a professional toy maker. He made an appeal to the popping up people to bring all their broken toys to Talbot's house. Murphy was mending these from morning till night 
so that they could be handed out at our Christmas party. He was such a good man. Christmas sadly had to be celebrated only in February due to the surprise Christmas offensive in the Ardennes. Here you see the local children with the men of the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment. In the late afternoon of the 11th of December, Tubby himself set foot in Talbot House, acting as though nothing had happened and the occupation had been but the nightmare sort of dreams. He received a great welcome home as everybody had hoped that the founding padre would be there to host the World Chain of Light, a ritual conducted annually by the Talk H members worldwide. Spectators recount, as the hour drew on, many other guests began to climb the stairs. There was quite a little crowd in the chapel, all ranks from the brigadier down to private and the La Haye family who had saved the lamp. As the clock on the stairs chimed 9pm, the lights in the chapel were extinguished and Major Slesser, a very old Talk H man, saying the one word, light, lit the lamp. Then there was a silence as we stood in half light cast by the lamp and in a few moments the voice of Tubby Clayton standing somewhere near the altar came booming in, reciting, At the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. Later he prayed and in his prayer mentioned great people and great things of the past and of another war, very different in many ways from the one now. And that night in the chapel at Pop I found myself very much in the middle of those memories. I was very much impressed. Various units would make welcome use of Talbot House the coming months, including the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, the 1st Czechoslovak Armoured Brigade and these chaps from the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment. Many visiting soldiers would maintain close connections with the house and their local friends. Several units would donate artefacts to the chapel as well. These include a new cross made out of shell cases, the Dunkirk altar and various crucifixes and statues. Over 4,000 service personnel from 120 different units would sign the visitor's book before the war was over. As Tebby concluded, so the old house, like an old violin, had led back into music, none the worse for its long silence, and the master's hand not only had revived its memories, but given it work to do in its old age. On Sunday 9th of May, you can join us on Facebook Live as we bring home one of the historic artefacts missing for over 50 years back to its rightful place in the Talbot House Upper Room. Hopefully you can join us then. See you soon.